name is Taylor Ray. This is my LS Miata. So we built this car at about a year is around how long it took. This is kind of V2, which if you don't already know why, uh, you'll understand later in this video, but we're gonna go through this whole build from start to finish. It was a long detailed build and there's a lot of stuff in there. So we're gonna condense it all down into one video to show you guys kind of how this car went from this to this. So quick backstory on the car. Me and my friend Adam went to go buy a Miata for his girlfriend. So I want to surprise her with a Miata for Valentine's Day. We are driving to Lakeland, which is about an hour and a half out, to go check out a car. It looks pretty clean. There it is. Oh, God. Can he see me? It's got a couple dents. Ooh, it looks very denty. We went and looked at it. It was nowhere near as nice as it looked, so we were still kind of looking around. I was actually looking for a Nissan 240SX to buy to have another drift car, and this Miata popped up. I don't think we're gonna end up getting the Miata. So after we got let down with the Miata, we looked at Craigslist for some more, and we saw a turboed one that like the paint was really that pretty or anything, so it wouldn't have been good for Nicole. But Taylor might be interested in it. So we're gonna go look at it, and if it's not a complete piece of junk, we'll probably take it home. So we may this trip worthwhile somehow. Like yeah, because we, we took all the money out of the bank. We have to spend it. No, we can't we can't go back with this money. It's Sunday, we can't deposit no, money. Yeah, no, that money is here. So we're gonna come home with a car, hopefully. We gotta spend the money. And it was 3200 bucks. It had a turbo motor, it had mega squirt, really nice turbo kit, coilovers, roll bar, like a bunch of good stuff on it. So we went and looked at it and needed a little bit of work. He went boost, like before he went boost, I agree. These 120s are slow as hell. Yeah. How was it? It was good, actually. Every time yeah? I drive, clutch like, Yeah? got another clutch for it, so. Tyler's been standing here trying to decide for the past, like, 20 minutes. I don't want to talk about it, okay? But it was so cheap, so I bought it. It's so happy. What do you have to say? I'm pretty excited. Are you? Yeah, but with every other car I've ever bought, it's just gonna go horribly wrong. At least it's documented. Now you can finally go on the track with me. We did the switcheroo. A car for you, and then now I'm taking a car home. I don't, I don't understand this. That's kind of how I ended up with a Miata. I didn't really intend to have one. I'd had a couple before, but it wasn't necessarily like what I was planning on buying. So anyway, I bought it, fixed the stuff, changed the clutch, did all this stuff. Two events later, it blew up. So, took the motor out, bought a motor from my now roommate Ben, a short block, reassembled it with my head, new head gasket, head studs, put it all back together. Two events later, Same thing. So the third time, I rebuilt the whole motor, capped the rings, did all this stuff, and uh, I wasn't gonna drive it, I was just gonna get rid of it so its curse would not be upon me anymore. And uh, I ended up driving it, took it to this abandoned neighborhood we go drifting at, and that kind of reignited my love for this car. I'd forgotten how much fun they were to drive. <laughs> C5 Corvette at the time as like my daily drifter kind of deal and it was nice and this car was a little beat up and pretty beat up and it was really fun to drive a car like that again so anyway that's what sparked my desire to keep it and build it instead of getting rid of it so what happened was that motor ended up low compression again so under one 174 so under three 176 so under four 176 so super healthy very very close cylinder two 125 from my past experience that means there's probably a hole in the piston or a cracked ring land or something. We spent a little bit of time trying to kill it. I mean, beating the crap out of it. It never really fully died. All it turned out to be was the previous owner had butt connected the injector clips for the larger injectors and the one was falling apart which i realized when it started misfiring on that cylinder completely and i took the wiring apart and it just fell apart so who knows how long they would have lasted but by the time i figured that out i had already started on getting everything together to do the ls i was committed to do the ls and the goal of this car and this build was to build a car that was affordable to drive but could keep up with cars that were expensive to drive because these cars with a turbo motor and crappy tires are pretty fast in drift so my thoughts were 350 400 horsepower and good tires should be really fast in drift but still be cheap to drive cheap on tires easy on the drivetrain etc so 
That's why we decided to build an LS Miata as a drift car. It's a little bit uh, unconventional, but we had our reasons. So once we decided to do it, the first step was to go buy a motor. All right, we are en route to go pick up a motor for the Miata. So I'm buying the motor from Grafton. So we got the motor all loaded up in the back of my first gen Dodge so that we could bring it home and kind of see what we were working with, see what it was like. So we got it home, got it unloaded with our engine hoist. This is actually a 5.3 out of a Suzu Ascender. Uh, but the unique thing about this one is it's an aluminum block. So then it was time to strip all of the truck stuff off of it. We weren't using the truck accessories, the truck intake. The only thing we were using was the wiring harness to send out to have a conversion service done on it. Once we got it all stripped down, it was an oven cleaner, bath, and a pressure wash, sauna to get it all cleaned up and ready to go. We don't want to work on a dirty motor. We weren't too worried about it being perfectly clean, but it's nice to clean it up enough to where you're not getting crap all over your hands anytime you touch the motor. So once it was cleaned up, we ordered all of our conversion parts and then we were able to really start diving in. So this part right here is definitely the number one reason Miata swaps are expensive. The way the factory crossmember is, there's not a lot of room to put any engine in. It generally an entire subframe needs to be fabricated. So then we start going through all of our Monster Miata conversion parts. We've got our radiator, we've got our mass motorsports oil pan designed to work with our subframe. We've got our rear diff mounts, our rear diff actual conversion to do our 488 diff, our clutch hydraulics, our fans. I mean, literally all of our swap parts from them so we can figure out what else we need. Now that we have all the pieces of the puzzle together in one place, we are ready to do this. So then it was on to making sure that the engine was good. We decided not to go too crazy and strip the bearings out or anything like that, but just make sure that the engine is not obviously damaged in any way. All right guys, today we're gonna be popping the valve covers and the oil pan off this engine just to verify, you know, there's no crazy gunk in there. We'll play with the rod bearings and make sure that sounds funny. So we stripped the valve covers off to check out the valve train components, make sure there's no broken rocker arms or anything obvious there. Wear-wise, everything looked pretty clean and as it should for an 80,000 mile motor. We ripped the oil pan off so we could get a look at the crank and the rod bearings, make sure we didn't have a bent rod or obvious bearing material or anything like that. We looked at the pistons to make sure none of them were cracked, looked at the cam to make sure none of the journals were worn, and I mean everything looked to be in good shape. So we painted our valve covers wrinkle red like anyone else would do and right, got them well, on the engine. That's what it looks like. So I picked up this LS2 intake manifold from my buddy Eric. We then ordered some G8 manifolds off eBay to strip down, grind down, clean up, and get ceramic coated because they are meant to fit with our swap kit. We got our cam, valve springs, and trunion upgrade in to redo the valve train on it. So we first get the cam in. It's a sloppy stage two cam, 228, 230 duration, and I think 595 lift. A uh, really re easy install. These LSs, man, putting a cam in them is a piece of cake. Doing the valve springs is a bit of a time consuming project, but we got that done without too much trouble. Ta-da, valve spring out. It's like 130 bucks shipped. I think they're good for like 600 or 610 lift, something like that. And they're cheap and they, they work. We got our rocker arm stripped of the needle bearings that are likely to fall apart and go flying through your motor and got our trunion upgrade in, trunion upgrade, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> reinstall them in the motor. All right, so we've got the trunion upgrade done, the pack 1218 valve springs done, the Elgin cam. Basically the rotating assembly is complete. With the rotating assembly done, it was time to get onto the chassis side of things. So we pulled out our 1.8 turbo motor that had let us down one too many times. Three was not our lucky number in this case, it was still a blown motor. Lift the trans up, swing it around. We need to pull this back some more. That's as far back as it's gonna go. With the engine out of the way, it was time to get the cleaning on the engine bay. So we bathed it in oven cleaner as well. It was very dirty. By the end of that motor's life, there was so much grease and so much oil all over everything. The engine bay was disgusting, even though we cleaned it every time we swapped the motor. Then I had to push it into the garage after I had got a bunch of grease and oven cleaner and anything else you can imagine on the ground that I had to walk on to push it into the garage. This was a bit of a funny moment for me. It took me forever to push this thing in, but we got it in and that's what matters. It's amazing what a pressure washer and some oven cleaner will do to an incredibly dirty engine bay that is now clean. We then moved on to stripping the chassis down. The wiring was the main thing. I originally wanted to try to keep my original chassis harness to keep the swap cheap and simple and not go too crazy, but with the Miatas, 
the entire like engine harness and chassis harness are integrated together so you can't just take the engine harness out and keep your chassis harness you have to basically take the whole thing out as one big unit so show them show them what the ls is going to be like uh, it's going to be like uh no give it give us give us like a first through third <laughs> Since we weren't going to be able to retain our factory wiring harness, I figured might as well strip this thing down to a bare tub and start from scratch. If we're going to rewire, we might as well do it right. Car is completely stripped, no interior, no wiring. Now it was time to button up the engine, so we put this improved racing crank scraper in to try to help with our oiling situation, and then we needed to do our front and rear cover gaskets with our front and rear main seals, and then get our new crank pulley on. So I used the torch method of torching it, you put it on and it hits the cold crank, it contracts and it is on there and it works great. Boom! Works like a charm. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> I hope you guys, yeah, I probably blocked the whole thing but it popped right on. A lot of people freaked out about the torch trick and were like, oh man, you could see your seal smoking, you could see it burning out of your motor, it, that seal's gonna pour oil out. Well, what do you know? Never leaked, not once. Boom, now we can put the fan on. Sick. With the front and rear covers done, the crank pulley on, it was time to put the oil pan on. So this is kind of the final step in sealing up the motor and the long block being complete. Everything's done. Cams in, valve springs, rocker arm upgrade, front and rear main seal, front and rear cover gaskets, the correct crank pulley, oil pan, oil pan gasket. It's all, this is it. This is what we need. So then we moved on to the transmission. We were using a CD09 trans in this car with a Collins adapter kit. So we get our adapter plate ready, which bolts to the face of the trans after you cut the bell housing off. We then get our bell housing bolted to that and get that bolted on our transmission. With the transmission setup done and ready to test fit on the motor, we're ready to test fit the motor in the chassis. To do so, we've got to cut these corners out of the engine bay. Pretty much the last thing we need to do to test fit the engine. So once we get those cut out, which was a bit of a struggle, but we got it done, we get the engine in the subframe, we get it all bolted up to the subframe, that way we can slide it all under the car, test fit it, and see if we cut out enough, we didn't cut out enough, or what. Subframe is attached to lay most hair. Put these both on rollers and roll them under the uh, car here. So this is one of the biggest moments of the build. This is putting the engine in for the first time, seeing if the subframe fits, seeing if the engine fits, seeing if the CD09 fits. Nobody's really done that either. So this is kind of like all new stuff. This is a big, big moment. That's another ALS. Woo! Hell yeah. Dude, it fits. Oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah, no, that's sick. Dude, Ben, it happened. Yeah. It happened. So we might have to clearance this area a little more. We might try to mock up an exhaust manifold. Right where that rubber boot is, so it would be perfect. Very minimal cutting, if anything. And this is the first time I think anyone's done a CD09 behind an LS. In a Miata that I know of, at least. That is an LS in a Miata. So I decided that I was gonna weld some metal plates in here. So I kind of formed some metal plates to weld in just to make it look a little better. They're not really needed for structural rigidity, but it kind of looked like crap, even though it is buried behind the engine. These didn't come out great, but something's better than nothing, right? So then we move on to getting the transmission finished up so we can get it back on the motor for the final time. So the first step of that is putting our GK Tech shifter in. So this moves the shifter location forward drastically, which we need based on where our shifter ends up. We then get our flywheel on that comes with the Collins adapter plate, our clutch disc, our pressure plate. We get all that bolted up and then it's time to put the trans on. I'm really surprised I was able to wrangle this thing on by myself. This is a heavy beast. The CD09 is not by any means a light transmission, but it went on no problems which is pretty rare, pretty rare. So then we wanted to move on to the accessory drive. So I wanted to get all this done while it was out of the car. We went with LSX Innovations on these. The brackets are amazing, the price is amazing. Really, really good stuff. So we got the alternator on, the power steering pump on, the water pump on, we put our manual tensioner by them on. I actually flipped it the wrong way. Like it's upside down right now, which is why it's covering that water outlet. But still, we got the belt on, we got the water pump, hose loop on and the accessory drive is done and I mean this is pretty much the last thing that the motor needs before it goes back in the car for its final time you know we've test fitted it we've got the rotating assembly done now this is kind of like the cherry on top the transmission the shifter the accessory drive I mean literally everything the last thing we got to do is get our manifolds done and we are ready to slap it back in 
While we're waiting to get our manifolds back from the ceramic coater, we decided to jump onto the rear subframe. So this is the other big part of the swap. One big part, getting the engine in the car. Other big part, getting the rear Ford 88 swap done. So we start by pressure washing everything just to have a clean base to work with. And then what we need to do is get our Monster Miata brackets centered and tacked up on the subframe, measure everything, make sure it's all good, get it grinded down and cleaned up. Once it's tacked, we can take the diff and test fit the diff and make sure that it fits before we actually weld it out. Seems to fit well. And three quarters on each side. They're slotted, you know, just in case it doesn't line up right. This was a pretty cool part of the project for me because I had learned to weld and I'd kind of been figuring it out and gotten proficient in it. And this was my first real welding project. So this is something I was really excited for. I actually, I think I learned how to weld because I knew I was gonna do this project and I wanted to do it myself because it's something I've wanted to learn for a long time. So I was definitely really, really proud of the result and how this came out. All right, I'm pretty happy with how the welds came out. My best work, but not terrible either. We then lay a coat of primer just so we don't get any flash rust because we know it's going to be probably a week or two before we actually paint and assemble this. And then we jump onto our fuel system. So we got Deechworks 50 pound injectors, some eBay fuel rails. We've got our LS2 intake with the Holly throttle body. So we start getting all of that assembled so we can get the intake on the motor officially for the final time as well. Then it is time to weld the diff up. So we got super lucky with this diff. I bought this diff for 40 bucks. The guy who sold it to me thought it was like a two something ratio. And I opened it up and it turned out to be a 327 which is exactly what we wanted so we got a steal on this diff so we got it all welded up so we have a locked rear diff and then we got the rear cover bolted back on and sealed back up and it's ready to go on the subframe another big thing we wanted to do while the car was apart and stripped down and you know there was no good paint on it or anything like that was take it to go get caged so we took the good old first gen man i miss this truck sometimes and we took the car down to chris jackson in south florida to get the cage done and he did an amazing job it's so nice I'm so blown away. Like, I keep saying like too much, but look at how tight it is. The welds were great, the fit up was great, and this was kind of a big moment for me too because I'd never had a properly custom built caged car. You know, and I've been tandeming and needed one, I finally had one. So we went to town on this thing. We spent the whole night painting it. This metal engine bay color was actually supposed to be just kind of a normal gray, so it would be easy to spot leaks, and it turned out to be this kind of like aluminum color, but I really was pretty happy with it. I kind of liked it. So I decided to do the cage itself in copper. So, you know, something a little flashy, something so you can see the cage, because like I said, I hadn't ever had a cage. I wanted to be able to see it out of the car and see it through the window, and that, that was just something that I wanted. So we painted it all up. Man, painting a cage is a process because you got to get all the way around the bars just so many spots it is so easy to miss spots but we laid down as many coats as we had cans i went back the next day and sprayed some clear over it to try to protect it it still didn't work very well spray paint on cages and engine bays is not very good it doesn't hold up very well but now it is time to put the engine in the car for the final time and for those of you who wonder how we got sandy here's the story oh also these cats just showed up on our back porch one day um and we like said hi to him one was stuck so we like rescued him and then they kind of like went on their way and then they just came back every night at around midnight and then we gave them some food and some water and then next thing you know they live here <laughs> so at this point we've only test fitted the engine we didn't go through and actually install it we had gotten our headers back from the ceramic coater and got those on the engine and we hadn't even tested with the headers in there so one thing we ran into immediately was the shifter I was hoping that the shifter was going to fall into the hole where it was supposed to go, but of course that is not how things worked out. So the first thing we needed to do to get it to fit was clearance the shifter hole and open it up a little bit. So then we were running into an issue with the steering shaft. It was hard to get it past the header by dropping the car down on it. So I pulled the steering shaft out so that I could put the engine up in there and then try to slide the steering shaft past the header after the engine was already in the car. But little did I know there was another issue. All right. So this is a good example of why you should look at things thoroughly before you start doing stuff. So I noticed it was hitting a little bit here. So that's why I hammered that in. Still really wasn't working. I couldn't get this hole or this hole to line up properly. I couldn't get the engine where it needs to be. There was room in these slots to move it back and forth, but it was binding up. I kept thinking it was that. So I hammered some more and then I'm like, man, I don't know what's going on. Well, what was going on, which I noticed this before I even started, but I didn't remedy it, that pocket 
for the handbrake, the shifter was hitting on it, so the shifter couldn't go over far enough. So once I hammered that in and fixed that, now I can get those back bolts in finally. So it's been about a two hour struggle bus, but the feeling of getting that bolt to finally throw it in, very satisfying. So, and put it back in. So stoked the motor is finally back in for the last time, hopefully, fingers crossed. So with the engine bolted up and finalized, it was time to get the rear subframe figured out. So basically what we've got to do is take these stock Ford axles that work with our aftermarket hubs for the Ford axle spines and our 488 diff and swap the actual shafts to shorter shafts. So we have to strip them completely apart and swap to these other shorter shafts. So it was a bit of a struggle. It took me a little bit to figure it out, but once I got it figured out, it really wasn't that bad of a process. It was just kind of a steep learning curve, never taking an axle apart. So that was a new thing for me. Once we got the axles done, it was time to drop the old subframe out because we needed to strip it down to take all of our arms and hubs and all of that stuff off to swap over to the new subframe with the 488 diff mount and diff. Ta-da! With the subframe out and stripped apart, we went ahead and painted all of our suspension arms silver. I don't know why I chose silver. I think it's just because I had it left over. Uh, but one of the things you have to do is swap the hubs to the hubs with the correct spines for the Ford axles. But Miata hubs are notorious for getting the inner bearing rate stuck on them when you press them out. So then you can't reuse that bearing, which is what we were planning on doing for who knows why. So now we had to get the bearings out to replace them. But of course, that project did not go very smoothly. Prime example of why you think before you do. I uh, went to knock this other bearing out and I forgot to take the snap ring out so I just smashed it a hundred times trying to get it out which pinched the snap ring so I finally got the snap ring out but then the bearings just exploded out of the center so now the races are stuck in there and I just tried to saws on them and it's not happening so I opted to buy these dual caliper knuckles from Ben since I needed to replace my knuckles anyway because the bearing races are stuck in them. We got those and kind of the rest of everything on the subframe. We got the new energy suspension bushings all in, the arms all painted, the diff in, the axles in. We got the whole thing assembled and now it is time to throw it all back in the car. This is another one of those big steps. I mean, the engine and the rear diff swap subframe, big, big steps for the car. So you can peep the uh, leg jack jacking method. Works great when you're working by yourself to get something in like this. So the next step is to get our BC Racing DS coilovers in. We had BRs in it and we are upgrading to the Digressive DS series while we're doing this Let's build. Look right in there, especially with the DSs. Look, they match. Oh, now you can see. <laughs> oh man, I am hyped. This was a big, big step, guys. Big step getting this in. Pushing look rad. I, I am happy about the silver even though it's already like trashed. So now that our subframe was completely assembled in the car, brake rotors, brake calipers, everything, the rear of the car is a roller again. So now it's time to move back onto the front. So what we need to do is get our steering rack in. This was a challenge with the engine in there. It's a very tight fit between the steering rack and the oil pan. And the biggest struggle was getting the steering joint on. We had so much trouble with this. We eventually figured it out towards the end, but it was a challenge every single time. The other part of that challenge was our clearance by the header, which is what made that such a problem. So what we have to do is basically bend this bracket over where it bolts into the firewall to get the steering shaft to kind of move over some and shoot past the header there. You can see it's touching the header now we need like a solid eighth inch of clearance. So once we get that done, struggle bus over, we move on to our steam ports, we get those on. I repainted the valve covers wrinkle black because the wrinkle red got destroyed when we were putting the engine in and out. So the black looked a little better anyway. The red was just kind of out of place with everything else. Then we move on to the radiator install. So because this engine is a little bit longer than the Miata engine, the radiator ends up being pushed under the core support to give you room for the clearance for the serpentine belt system. So what we have to do is notch this core support a little bit so that the radiator can sit as far forward as possible and as far up as possible. So basically the back side of the radiator is flush with the core support giving us as much room as possible. So we get that in pretty easy and we move on to our radiator hoses. So these were just some off the shelf ones. We cut them to fit. We got kind of like what, what we thought would work cut them to size, got them on, easy peasy. Our angle kit that we bought originally did not fit with our uh, Monster Miata subframe. So we had to put our stock suspension loosely back on, which we didn't have really any of the stuff because I threw a lot of it away like an idiot. And uh, yeah, so we just kind of threw that together enough to make it a roller. We got the clutch master cylinder in to work with the T56 slave. We got it bled. Steve, show them what it do. Ah, look at that. Look at that, it's a clutch pedal. It's kind of firm. Feels Look like at my that. car. We have a clutch pedal. Ah. Dang, isn't that a cool sight? This thing on the ground, even though it's not completely official, the rear is kind of official. We still need to put the other caliper on. 
the front not at all the front is just put together so I can roll this thing <laughs> the trans mount is a 4x4 four four with a ratchet strap it's on the ground it has wheels on it and it has an LS in it so as with any project, there's all the tinkery stuff. So we used some CAD cardboard A to design, made ourselves a little template, and then we cut it out of metal and used the factory throttle cable bracket piece where it clips in, welded that to it, and then we have a throttle cable bracket, which worked perfectly, which was amazing. Very, very nice feeling. And then what we needed to do is get the trans mount in. So I tacked the two pieces together where they needed to be. I drilled the holes so the holes would be lined up, and then we welded the trans mount in place. Very very exciting that is a big step because now i can measure for my drive shaft and get my drive shaft ordered and then the drive train is done uh, so we're going to go up top undo the ratchet strap i hope that it doesn't break off and just fall down <laughs> So once that was done, I measured for the drive shaft. I got my wiring harness in and started hooking it all up. I got it ran into the inside of the car so I could kind of figure out where I wanted to mount the ECU. Steve came over. Steve helped a lot with this part of the project. He had an LS swap me out. It was kind of cool to be able to reference it, um, but he was over there several days a week honestly and it's an hour and a half drive for him so that was a big thing he was a huge help so once we had the wiring harness in it's only three wires it's constant power key on power ground and then we needed to run a wire to the starter so we did all that so that we could start it for the first time this is our first ever startup obviously it didn't go quite as planned you could see some fire some sparks uh we're not very good at this all right guys oh, so we we unjankified our setup we took the power cable from the miata the original power harness. You can see the smoky haze in the background. <laughs> but it fired like instantly. Solid, just like, like boom. So well, you missed it. If you, missed if you ever need to start an engine like we are, just rigging it up, take time and put some proper terminals on the starter and stuff. Cause yeah, because we. Kept it makes the, it so much easier. The jumper cable kept falling off, and it would want to short. <laughs> Fire. You gotta give it some more. You gotta keep it going. All right, all right. We'll we keep gotta, it going. We gotta get just a little bit. My air fuel ratio isn't very accurate. <laughs> so this was my last project at this house. After this, I moved in with Ben, which is where I live now with the shop and everything. So it was a big move. We got everything over there. The car kind of stayed in the state for a little while while we got the shop all set up. We made these pallet racking. We got all my stuff organized. The car kind of sat in the corner, waiting in the wings, waiting for me to have time to work on it. So we finally got everything set up and had time. So we pushed the Miata out of the little corner nest it had been sitting in for... I don't even know, probably a week or two, we had the hood strapped down because we had to tow it and there's no hood latch and you know, just one of those things. But now we have no excuses, we have more time than ever to get this thing done. So we don't have a lift jet, so we use our quick jacks which have done us well in the past, so they'll do as well now. We got our custom drive shaft back with our 350Z joint in the front, our 488 in the back, we got that installed. We got our destroyer die angle kit in, so I figured out that this kit would actually work with my subframe. We got their awesome drop knuckles, super angle drop knuckles, knuckles, their custom extended lower control arms with camber adjustment. These are really, really nice pieces. So we started getting them all on the car. Neighbor Al came by to supervise and make sure we weren't slacking off. We didn't have rack spacers, so we were able to finish up the install, but we were missing a crucial piece to test the angle out. The rack spacers allow the rack to turn further so you get like more angle out of it. So then the biggest life mod happened, a lift, a dream come true. It's real guys, I have a lift. I finally have my own lift. Like, this is such a surreal moment. Look at how tall this thing is. I'm about to do tie rods at chest level on my own car, on my own lift. This is a very exciting moment. So now we really have no excuses. We got a lift, we got time. So we put our inner tie rod spacers on and we can finally see how much angle she has. Look at that, guys. Destroyer die did it right. That's solid. That's really good. That might be more than my Z. With the angle kit and the majority of the suspension done, it's time to move on to wiring. This is probably one of my favorite parts of the build because this is something I was really intimidated by, wiring. And I decided to go with an ECU Masters PMU. So what that is, is it's that little black box down there. And instead of having fuses and relays and running all these wires to everything, it is all solid state. It's infinitely resettable. You don't ever have to worry about like a fuse going bad and your fuel pump dying mid run or anything like that. So we started tackling this project. It was definitely a big one. I mean, we are rewiring the whole car, headlights, taillights. We're using these weather pack connectors to make a bunch of little sub harnesses so we can disconnect everything individually and we don't end up with a wiring harness that we can't ever take out of the car because it's all one big piece that's like 
stuck in there forever. The PMU out, but also pull the connector with all the wiring out when I need to add or remove or change stuff. Uh, so that's what I've been working on, just making all of these little different sub harnesses. So we finally figured out where we were gonna mount it. We were finishing up all of our little connectors. All right, so I've got most of everything pinned. Like here's my fans, my ignition. This is the uh, business end of the connector. Uh, it looks like we have a lot of open spots. A lot of those are inputs, but since we're using a keypad, we don't really have that many inputs. I hooked up the connector. Um, and then this is basically our PMU ignition, so I'll turn that off now. We got everything loosely in there and kind of ran to what we needed to run the main stuff because we have to go through the ECU Masters PMU software and set, you know, I want this button to do this, I want this one to be momentary, I want this one to stay on, and all of that stuff so that we could try to fire it up without having sketchy wiring to a battery on the ground that tries to set on fire every five seconds, but actually with the wiring that we made ourselves with our harness through the car. It works. It works. It works. I, I know this is the same thing as last time <laughs> with starter fluid and all, but that is all through the chassis wiring that I did with the PMU and the ECU and everything, which is very simple with this wiring harness, but I'm just happy. The PMU works. Now that we've got the wiring at least somewhat figured out, our last hang up before getting the motor properly running is the fuel system. So we have all of these Dietworks components. I mean, fittings, line, regulator, filter, injectors. I mean, literally everything they offer, we threw at this thing. So we had to go through and make all of our individual lines for our feed, our return, everything. So we got all of our lines made. We got them all installed in the car. Final line. It's the final fuel line. Oh, no, there's one more. We filled her up with fuel and... All right guys, moment of truth. shouldn't run along and it's open header, but it runs! It actually runs. So with another major milestone out of the way, it was time to get back to all the small stuff. So we finished up all the wiring, routing it, looming it, heat shrinking it, running it properly. We made some more wiring pigtails for our gauges and future add-ons so we wouldn't have to mess with that later and tried to make everything as serviceable as possible. So once we got the wiring done, we could finally put the interior back in. So we got the carpet in, we got the dash in, we got our gauge cluster in, our clamshell, our gauge hood. I mean, we're just moving right along with getting this thing back to being a normal car. The biggest interior project we had to tackle was taking apart our old 1.8 tombstone since we had swapped to a 1.6 dash which uses a different center tombstone and getting all of our gauges and stuff to go into it getting our keypad in there and bolted incorrectly and the wiring ready and all of that stuff so we got it done and back in the car and finally fully wired up tombstone is installed for the hopefully final time <laughs> wide band coolant temp oil pressure beautiful moment right here Pump, chassis wiring, interior install. I mean, we're not completely done with that, but front suspension, we already did that. Look at that, dual caliber exterior. I guess exhaust needs to go on here too. Oh yeah, intake. I don't know, that's all I can think of for now, but look at that. Look at that, where we've come from, look at that. Okay, okay, goodbye. So then we started tackling the exterior projects, getting the front bumper on and test fitted, getting our front lip on, getting our rear bumper and rear lip on. So now it was time to turn our attention to the tune. The tune we had was for 80 pound decapped injectors. We had 50s, we had a one bar map, not a three bar map. So Matt sent us some revisions and now we can try to drive it. The first time the Miata has moved under its own power.
forgot I had no brakes halfway through and I was like, wait, how do I stop? How do I stop? And I just like poured in gear and went forward. And then I was like, I, just, I have a handbrake, it works. All right, well, uh, obviously not the super climactic first drive we want, but again, with the open headers and the fuel lines being right there and no heat wrap yet and all that stuff, like I just don't, I don't want to chance it. I don't want to burn a fuel line and set my car on fire to drive it around with open headers and no power steering. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. So obviously the next step so we could actually get a real drive in was to take it to get an exhaust built. So we took it down to our buddy Tim Marici and he built a really beautiful custom exhaust. This exhaust build and being there for the project is what really, really got me back into wanting to become proficient in TIG welding. I absolutely love fab work. I love making stuff and just seeing this come to life was just one of those things that really got me excited about it again. So now we are about to hear what the Miata sounds like, not open header, with a real exhaust for the first time ever. insane so then it was just kind of the knickknack stuff holding us up from driving it we had been pulling it on and off the trailer with no brakes so brakes were kind of the first thing we needed to address i picked up some new wheels from steve while i was down there getting the exhaust made so we had to roll the fenders so ben got all the dual caliper stuff on we got the new power stop brakes like i said track day like sure track pad whereas this is more of like a street track pad Another one of those projects we needed to get done was an intake. We've been running around with just kind of an open throttle body. So we had to cut this bar out, weld this bar in so we'd have clearance with the bumper and the intake because otherwise it sits up too far. We had to cut and notch the bumper, make it work. And we tested that a few times and finally got it cut right. Ta-da! <laughs> I'm really fond of these VET intake setups. They're such a clean, clean way to do it. We were able to test fit our new SSR RS8-2 wheels. I was really excited about these. I'd wanted some JDM, like old school style wheels to put on this car. I was debating between stock body and body kit and we were leaning towards stock body and these just fit with the look. So once that was done, the car was semi-drivable enough to get it on the trailer to take it to paint. Miata is dropped off to get painted. This is Adam, he's gonna paint it. What's up guys? Oh, it looks so good just seeing it all one color in general. Oh, I know, it is, it's darker right now. Yeah, no, it's sick. From back there, you just, you can't even tell. Oh my God. Dude, in the- Damn. In the, in the sun, it is completely Holy different. shit, it, it looks so sick right now. Yeah, you see the roof, man? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, oh, it looks so like classy. Oh my god, it looks so sick, dude. This is, this is nuts. My Miata has a sick paint job. Like, this is a day, it, it, this car being finished was a day that felt like it was never gonna happen. And then this car being painted and having like a clean body and all of that is one of those things that just felt like it may never happen. And now it's, it's there, it's, painted it's ready to go and it's like a super sick paint job with the car back from paint i didn't want to risk rubbing the tires on the fenders and messing up the paint so we raised the front of the car up and the other main project we had to tackle was getting a seat bolted in the seat was sitting in there loosely for the longest time and so many times i almost crashed this thing off the trailer because i'd go to push the clutch in and the seat would fall back and it was a mess so now it is time for our first drive which doesn't start off very well as the car starts getting hot By the end of the first drive, the car was getting super hot. So we coasted it back into the shop. We figured out that the steam ports were loose and it was just pouring, cooling out. Test drove again, same kind of problem. Turns out the thermostat was stuck. We took that out. Car still didn't run quite right. I noticed that I'd never set my fuel pressure regulator. I never hooked a vacuum source up to it. So we did that and then we went out for a drive again to see if it fixed it, thinking that it wouldn't have. And lo and behold, Oh my god. 
So now that the car was actually driving, it was finally time to bite the bullet and order some seats. So I ordered these Momo seats. I got a start and a Halo seat. The Halo seat was actually shipped to me accidentally. Didn't end up keeping it, wasn't a huge fan of it, but we finally had seats in the car, properly mounted, and we got our final tune from Matt. We've been sending him tunes back and forth. He got it dialed in and sent us the final tune. The car had been running super lean on the original tune, so this tune was us finally adding some fuel to it, and man, what a difference. We got our destroyer die drop knuckles in the mail, so these basically change your roll center so they move your control arms more towards flat with the car lowered, so we got those installed. And we knew a good upgrade to do would be an oil cooler, so I made some little brackets, welded them on, got the oil cooler bolted on, we got our lines made, got that figured out, got, you know, obviously the system bled, filled with oil, and then we decided, okay, let's take this thing for a two hour drive to Daytona for the turkey rod run. So that's a once a year car meet, bunch of classic cars and cool stuff. I love going there every year. And I thought, you know, what better of a shakedown of the car than to drive it two hours. So this was a really, really fun trip. We drove it all the way there, did burnouts. and then drove it all the way home with the only complaint being that the exhaust was loud so we had to wear headphones to listen to music. <laughs> Our rear shelf area where the top would normally fold down was cut out so that the cage could be put in so I made this little diamond plate piece just to cover it and then put our carpet back in so that we'd actually have some support back there not the carpet just kind of hanging down all sketchy. Another thing we had to do since we had drop knuckles both front and rear, which we didn't account for when we spec'd out the coilovers, was to take the coilovers apart and put some longer shocks in. So what this did was give us ride height back because it was too low at max high before and give us a little bit of extra shock stroke. We were able to gain some more suspension travel. Another important suspension model we needed to do was put a big front sway bar on. So we put this aftermarket, I think this is a racing beat adjustable front sway bar on it. So then we moved on to building an expansion tank. So like I said, I was really inspired by the exhaust work and wanted to get better at TIG welding, so I started practicing hardcore more and more, and I got pretty dialed on steel, and then I moved to aluminum, I learned aluminum, and now we were able to build this expansion tank. So what this is, is it is an expansion of our cooling system. So the reason for this is because our radiator sits below our core support, and thus is lower than the highest point of our cooling system in our engine. Because of that, we would not be able to properly bleed out our cooling system, because we, we don't have the highest point to fill from. So what this does is this brings our fill point up, and allows for a little bit additional cooling volume, which it, you know, isn't really that important, but we made it to where the big side is the expansion tank, so that's part of our pressurized cooling system, and then the small side is the overflow, so we kind of made it all into one unit, and it was really, really cool to build this because it was my first aluminum TIG actual project, not just practice, and it was, you know, building something perfectly custom fit for my car to fit in that exact space, fill that spot, and I, I don't know, I was really, really proud of this. Ta-da! It's finally done! All the welding is done. Ben even commented that these, uh, the bungs and like the cap and stuff, the welds came out nicer than the rest of it. Okay, it's in. For now, we're gonna fill it up and run the car and see what happens. <laughs> Hope that it doesn't leak. So another thing that I put off forever was building a power steering line. I didn't think I'd be able to find the right fitting, so I put it off and I put it off and then I didn't drive the car for a bit because I didn't have a power steering line, I didn't want to run the pump dry, and then finally we just said screw it and we drove it, but finding the fittings was fine. I did some research, I found the fitting for the pump, the rack, I got PTFE 90 degree fittings, PTFE line, and we were able to make our power steering line. The only problem was, once we put it on, all those miles of driving around the pump with no fluid in it burnt the pump out. So there's a weep hole for when the pump goes bad and fluid just started pouring out immediately. So we swapped to another pump, we got everything hooked back up correctly and bolted back in and bled and all that good stuff and we finally had working power steering for the first time, which was really exciting because like I said, I put it off for a long time and I really needed to do it and we finally did it. So we had this little YouTuber extravaganza coming up. It was Adam LZ's open house and we had all decided to do some fun events around it, drag racing, drifting, and road racing. So I got these Nitto 225s on the car for the road racing portion of things. We also were never 
were able to really properly dial in our rear alignment. So that was another thing we needed to address to make these tires fit and align the car for drifting and then align it for drag racing and then align it for road racing. So what we did was we put these adjustable upper control arms on. I was supposed to build some of these. I never got around to it. So Ben let me borrow his so we could get it done. And then we took the car out to an abandoned neighborhood. So this is kind of our first performance test. We've driven it around, we've putted it around, but we've never actually driven it hard. main reasons for this was I didn't want to show up to an event, thrash on the car for the first time and find a bunch of issues because that's how it always works with a fresh build and I'm glad we did because we found an issue. Okay well that's why I wanted to test it. Power steering fluid is already incredibly hot which means I will likely need a power steering cooler. Could work on resolving our newfound issues we had to finish up the last couple things we needed to do e85 was one of the things i got this content sensor put in with our Deechworks fittings i got it wired in and i got the hb tuners to work with it thanks to matt at sloppy mechanics Woo! 67.8 percent ethanol so now that we had all of that done it was time to take the car to the dyno to not only see what it made but get the tune finally dialed in Uh, torque 339 horsepower that's dialing it back for a safe tune because we weren't really gaining anything with the more like the extra timing up top so he kept pulling out timing to see if it dropped any didn't really drop we lost like two horsepower best we did was 345 basically and that was ice cold like second run in so this is that's a solid number for multiple multiple runs in a row like the car doesn't have a real chance to cool down we do a run, change the tune a little bit, do it, and huge shout out to Matt because he's literally, I'm sending him the logs and then he sends me a tune file and I take the tune file, put it on, do a pull. Like he's like remote tuning through Facebook Messenger, it's hilarious. So we found two weak spots on the car when we went and did that abandoned neighborhood testing. Weak spot one, power steering fluid, it was boiling over. Weak spot two, brakes. So the stock brakes never felt very good on this car and brakes were something I wanted to upgrade because having nice brakes and drifting is amazing for left foot braking. When you're tandeming behind somebody and you're trying not to get too close, you have your left foot on the brake, you run out of brake booster pressure, so you're basically manual brakes. So having nice brakes is super helpful. So we decided to go all out and upgrade to these Willwood four piston front and rear. The only problem is it's kind of pricey since we got to do dual calipers and when you upgrade the rotor to a larger diameter, you have to change the caliper too. So we just went with dual Willwood four pistons, which is pretty baller, I have to say. So of course we mounted our oil cooler in the one spot where we couldn't fit another cooler. So what we had to do was rotate them both sideways so that we could fit a power steering cooler in there. So now I was feeling feeling the flow with fab work and I was able to kind of whip some stuff up pretty quick. So I whipped up this bracket in like 20, 30 minutes, which was another kind of pride moment for me because I had been learning how to fabricate. I hadn't been very good at it. And now I was able to kind of actually make stuff quickly without having to sit and think about it in super detail. So. We got this bracket put up there and it, it was a little bit elaborate because it had to go around the tow hook and whatnot. And the other side was a lot simpler. It was just two pieces together, but it was really cool. It was really cool to build this. I was really happy with how the oil cooler placement went. They're nice and tucked up. So if we get into any accidents, they're not gonna be way out there ready to get hit. They were nice and solid. They still left the center chunk of the radiator open for airflow. I mean, all in all, it worked out really well. With our cooler situation figured out, it was time to install our big brake kit. So this has two piece rotors in the front. They're about an inch I think maybe even more than an inch larger than the factory ones you can't really see in that camera angle but we got those on front and rear and we're ready to go test it wow well that was definitely a very successful test drive the brakes feel phenomenal this side. yeah made it to the drag strip this is the first time I have ever been in here, ever. Same. 
So the first event of our three events was drag racing. Obviously, I didn't build the car for that, but I was curious to see what it would run, and I'm always down to do something that beats on the car. Beating on a car is, is fun. So I guess technically we kind of won this one. Uh, our Miata was the fastest thing. We ran a 12.3 with no fifth gear, which was a weak point that we found in the car. Uh, it doesn't want to go into fifth or stay in fifth. So we just ended up riding it out through the traps in fourth on Revelmeter. I think I think it was actually a 12-1. So I think we could definitely dip into the high 11s if we had fifth gear working, but obviously we didn't that day. So we just worked with what we had and we had fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun going back to back and just thrashing the car. So now we are moving on to the climax of the story. This car is a drift car. This is going to be our first time drifting it. So this is a really big deal for me. You know, I've been building this car for a long time and I'm curious to see how it does. Today is the day. This is a very big day. So the LS Miata, the channel, me, it's gonna be its first time drifting. We don't have a handbrake in it because my second set of rear calipers didn't show up in time, so I couldn't put the handbrake in. Today really is just a shakedown day. I wanna figure out the car, figure out its strengths, its weaknesses, things I need to address before like the first actual drift event. But timing worked out perfect because private days like this are very stress-free and I have plenty of time to mess with the car and figure out you know, any issues that I might have or anything like that. But So we started drifting it and we were having trouble with the self-steer. The car just didn't quite feel right, which ends up being an issue for a long into V2 2.0 but we'll get into that later basically we're drifting the car it doesn't feel quite right but you know it, it didn't matter like it was the first time drifting it I've been building this car for a year I've got a V8 in a Miata it's on the track I'm drifting it like, to me that's what matters just like it like gets like halfway and then just doesn't self steer anymore it's like really throwing me off I have to like feed it, it. all right <laughs> So all the cars that I have had in my life of drifting have been like, let's say 250 horsepower for a 2700 pound car. This is a 350 horsepower, 23, 2400 pound car. So this is a big thing for me. This is the first car I've ever had where I can throw it up a gear like I do here in a second and just bake the tires off. And it was just so cool to be able to do that for the first time. I wanted to build a car like this that was more than just barely able to drift, barely enough power to drift, and this was finally it. So even though I'm uncomfortable in the car, I'm still so stoked to be able to do this. There she is. So I started to notice that throughout the day when I would get back from doing a few runs, the oil pressure at idle would be like five PSI, six PSI, and then it was like, two, three PSI, but when I turned it off, it would go to like negative two, three, four. So I was like, oh, okay, it's probably like seven, eight, 10 PSI at idle, which is a little low, but I mean, it's manageable. It's not a problem. I really didn't want to accept the fact that the oil pressure was low. So when I went out this time, I was like, you know what? I should probably pay attention to the gauge while I'm drifting and see what it is. So coming around here, I remembered, oh, let me look at the gauge. And I noticed that at a uh, red line, it's only about 30 PSI. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of odd. And then it was making this uh, light noise, which I thought was probably drivetrain, but then, uh, no, it got worse. Yeah, after that, I could not be in denial any longer. That is 100% rod knock. All right, the Miata is back home safe and sound. Still drove in under its own power. At the end of the day, it was a $700 junkyard motor with a $400 cam and spring combo thrown in. If you guys watched the series, you know, we didn't open up the bottom end, we didn't do anything. My whole kind of thoughts from the beginning of this were I wanna get the motor in the car, I wanna get the car running and driving. Um, and if it turns out the first time I started it has rod knock, like so be it. 
the hard part is getting everything else done. It's getting the swap done, the car wired up, like everything else done. Changing a motor at that point is not a big deal. And that's kind of where we're at, you know? So we wasted no time and the very next night we decided to start tearing it down. So we pulled the motor and trans out, the whole drivetrain on the subframe, dropped it right out the bottom and then started tearing into it to see not only what went wrong, but if it was going to be fixable, if we were going to re be able to reuse this block and this crank and stuff, or if we were going to need to source a whole other motor. Yeah, I think that's a spun bearing if I've ever seen one. Oh yeah, that bearing is toast. That is a spun bearing. You can see like where the heat melted it and then it started spinning around the crank because there's nothing to hold it in place. That is trashed. <laughs> yeah, look at that one. Woo, look at that one. That's a spun bearing. That's for sure, <laughs> holy hell. Look at that. I think it's toast. See this, this is crazy. I've never seen one like this. Literally fused together and it's like paper thin. That is crazy. That's nuts. I've never seen one that bad. So that's pretty much the death of version one. Um, it it kind of worked out though, because I not necessarily rushed through the build, but I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole with this car. I didn't want to sit there and, and end up like three years into a build because, oh, while I'm here, I'm going to do this. While I'm here, I'm going to do that. So I, I overlooked and didn't do a lot of stuff I wanted to do because I just wanted to get it done and get it running and driving because that is the biggest hurdle. Once it's running and driving, doing a motor swap, doing all this other stuff is easy. So when we came into V2 and we knew we had to put a different motor in it and go through all that, I decided to fix a bunch of things I wanted to fix. So let me know what you thought of the V1 build overview and stay tuned for V2. But for now, that is it for this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. I didn't scrub my tires in!